Every syllable of that passage is packed with meaning. So I hope that you'll open up your Bible to that passage. And it may even be helpful to use the Pew Bible and to open it up to that passage. But as you open it up to that passage, what I'd also like for you to do is put your finger on page 529 in the Pew Bible, which is Isaiah 53. I'd like for you to keep the Bible open to Isaiah 53 because Isaiah 53 and specifically the larger context of that, Isaiah 40 through 55 is probably the passage of Scripture that Paul had open in front of him when he was writing this letter to the Romans. We're going we're gonna to look at Isaiah 53 later in the sermon and even read part of that together, which is why I'm asking you to make sure you have it open in the NRSV version of the Bible, okay? We're going to look at that, we're going to read through it, we're going to feel it as we attempt to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ more deeply. This is the beginning of that. The series is called The House of Atonement. Atonement is a big theological word that means a lot of things. Today, if you look at the meditation in your worship guide, we might just say it means at one What has been separated has been brought together. What was broken apart has been made whole in Jesus Christ. And we'll unpack a lot more of what that means over the course of the next several weeks as we move toward Good Friday and Easter Sunday. But there's a lot of it packed into this passage. And in fact, some theologians have said this is the most important passage as it has to do with the atonement and the meaning of the crucifixion. So while this is the only week we'll read it, like, like Brandon just did, it might be that we return to it several times again and again and again. Within this passage, there is a pointer to a phrase that you hear over and over and over again in the New Testament, especially in these epistles. And that is in verse 21, it says, Apart from the law, a righteousness of God or the faithfulness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, which is sort of shorthand by saying all of the scriptures. And there's this phrase that you hear over and over and over again in the New Testament that may be hard to comprehend. It's so simple, it may not seem like it has a lot of meaning in it, but it has a lot of meaning in it. And, and the phrase is, the Messiah died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that's what he's saying here. The Messiah died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And if you talk to people in the early church, what they would say is, the whole gospel, the meaning of the cross, the power of the cross, is summed up in that. So I wonder how many of you in this room have heard someone tell you before that Jesus died for your sins? Raise your hand. Gosh, that's pretty much everybody in the room. Jesus died for your sins. You say, I've heard somebody say that Jesus died for my sins. Now, if I were to ask you how that works, I wonder how you might answer that question. Tony Jones is a theologian and a scholar and a pastor who was once a youth pastor in a Lutheran church. And he talks about when he was young, speaking and leading a group of students through confirmation. You Baptists know what confirmation is? Okay. You can look it up later. Google it. <laughs> leading a group through confirmation and um, have the parents in the room with the students and ask them a question. It says, how many of you have ever heard someone say that Jesus died for your sins? Just like you, all the hands in the room went up. And he said, okay. Now, how does that work? And they looked at him. He said, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. And I might ask you to try to begin doing this as well. There's a little note sheet in your worship guide that you can open up. I may not give you all the time you need to do it. I certainly won't. But you could write your answer to this question. He says, I want to ask the adults in the room a question. And here's the question. They all groaned. How does that work? How does it work for a man to die over 2,000 years ago for your sins and that to mean something for you now? How does that work? Why does that work? They all groaned. He said, I want you to write that down on that piece of paper, and then what I want you to do is pass the piece of paper to the child who came with you, and I want the child to grade you on your answer. To which they all groaned again. <laughs> Later, and you may be writing this down now, you might want to share it with some of the people with you. Later he says, he says now once you share it, I want the kids with you, the children with you, to shout out, their grade to your answer. And the grade started coming out and one, one girl loudly shouted out, C-! minus." 
To which her mom said, I didn't think I did that well. <laughs> she was proud of her grade. She was proud of her passing C minus. And you know, maybe we might get that a little bit better than, I don't know, that group of Lutherans. Who knows? Lutherans are good people. We'll see. But the truth of the matter is, probably a lot of us would have trouble answering that question. And probably a lot of us, if we studied enough, uh, looked at it enough, reflected on it enough, heard about it enough, we might come to the place where we would say, yeah, yeah, it's, it, I get it, but it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. And I guarantee you that's true. Whatever you think about the gospel, whatever you think about the cross, whatever you think about what Jesus accomplished on the cross through the atonement, it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. And what my hope is, as we move throughout this Lenten series, is that you will gradually begin to see that whatever you think it is, it's bigger than that. And that as a result of seeing that it's bigger than that, it won't be just that your information is growing and your understanding is growing, but that your awe of the gospel and of God will grow as well. And you will find yourself moved and falling more and more in love with Jesus and more grateful for what he has done for you and continues to do with you because of your larger, broadening understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The metaphor, and we've got it built here, Ed Gillen built Andrea and Marcy, Marcy Hendrick and Andrea Huffman's vision here. Ed Gillen built this wonderful little house of atonement. That's the, the title of our series, The House of Atonement. And you see that within the house there are all these windows. In fact, the house is so much made of windows that if we didn't have these colorful pieces of paper on there, you would be able to see completely inside the house. That's not how a lot of our houses work, but that's how this house works. So I said, please cover the windows. Uh, because <laughs> because we've got to have the metaphor working as well. But if you were to go to my house, if this was my house, and, and one of the reasons Christy says she wanted our house is because it has lots of windows, lots of light. And you were to walk up, having not been inside, you were to walk up and look in one of the windows, you would be able to see inside the house. You would be able to see some of what's going on inside of the house, some of how the house is decorated, some of what the house looks like, but you wouldn't be able to see the whole house. If you were to go around to other windows in the house, maybe step over here to the kitchen, take a ladder up to the, the kids' bedrooms, and look through each and every window, you would see more of the house. And if you look through all the windows of the house, and you were able to remember what you saw through each and every window, you would, you would begin to see a picture come into play that would give you an idea of what the inside of the house looks like. But even if you were to look through every single window, you wouldn't see the whole house. And even the house you saw, you wouldn't be in it. You wouldn't be experiencing it. There would still be much of the house left to be seen and left to be experienced. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is a lot like that. The atonement, the atonement, is a lot like that as well. So what I want to do is, each and every week of this series, I want to look at another window or two, into another window or two, into the house of atonement, with hopes that we might come away saying the gospel is bigger than that. It's bigger than what I thought. Now, as we look through each window, we'll see that some windows are, don't worry, Ed, I won't break it, cracked, that we see through some of these glasses darkly, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, that some of the, the vision within the window is skewed by the window. It's not exactly right. And yet there's always more to be seen and heard, apparently. One of the most prominent windows that you'll see as we look through the uh, House of Atonement is called the substitutionary window. And I want to put that for you, in front of you today because I think it's a very important window to look through to understand what's going on on the cross of Jesus Christ. But I also think that um, even as much as you understand substitutionary atonement, there's much more going on here. And, and what, what in fact is going on is that what you'll see is that not only is substitutionary atonement a window, but it's kind of a category of windows. And just about every understanding of the atonement can actually be categorized under either a victory category 
or a substitutionary category. Victory over the powers and principalities, and we're going to talk a lot more about that. That's not something we talk a lot about as Baptists. And then also this thing that happens relating to the forgiveness of sins through this view of substitution. Even still, though, the window we look through today may be a little cracked and distorted. One of the most popular views of the atonement right now that falls under the category of substitution, many theologians and scholars would say is a cracked view. There's some truth in it, and yet, and yet there is also some obvious untruth. There are some things that don't quite pass the smell test. It, it's, it's rooted in a view that Anselm of Canterbury began to tease out about a thousand years ago called the satisfaction theory. And the satisfaction theory of the atonement and you'll see some of this seemingly emanating out of Romans, is this idea that God is holy and we are not, and because of our sinfulness, the wrath of God burns against us. And in order for us to be atoned, to enter back into relationship with God, that wrath has to be satisfied some way, somehow, by someone. And so what happened on the cross, the satisfaction theory teased out, it's also called penal substitutionary atonement, would be that Jesus stood between us and the wrath of God as it was poured out on Him instead of us so that we wouldn't have to experience it and we could be brought back together with God. Now this view of the atonement, while wildly popular actually right now, whether it is for you, um, has been met with a lot of criticism. Some folks from abusive families would say, that reminds me of my abusive parent. This idea that, that the child Jesus is there and God is sort of angrily abusing this child, that somehow God needs to pour out this raging wrath in, other, in order to be appeased. And once that wrath is appeased, it's squelched, and we don't have to deal with it anymore because Jesus dealt with it. Yet that's, that's kind of problematic when you consider that the God revealed in Jesus, especially on the cross, is a God who is love. It doesn't seem to match up. Now some of this has helped when we consider that we shouldn't divide the Trinity and that what's happening on the cross isn't just a son appeasing an angry father, but it's something that happens in the life of a loving God. But still, it doesn't quite pass the smell test. There's something about this that just doesn't seem quite right. Something about it that doesn't quite seem quite right, and something about it that does. Because there's something about substitution that moves us, that seems right, that seems powerful. And even when we don't get it up here, we get it in here. And so we find even that element of substitution, that gospel element of substitution, appearing in the stories of our culture that we resonate most with, right? Some of you have read or watched The Hunger Games. Hunger Games uh, several years ago is a story about uh, a, a place where they had these games and, and, and someone is selected by a lottery from all these different tribes, usually children, to represent their tribe in this violent game where only one person is left standing. Everybody but one dies. You don't have a choice whether or not you want to participate in this. And the hero of the Hunger Games is a young woman named Katniss Everdeen. And Katniss was there at the lottery for her town and was waiting to see who would be selected. And the person that was drawn out of the hat or whatever was her little sister Prim, who she realized wouldn't last a day in the Hunger Games. So there was some sort of rule embedded into the Hunger Games and maybe it's reflective of some sort of rule that it's embedded into our cosmos. I don't know that if you wanted to, you could stand up and be a tribute in place of the person who was selected. So Katniss 
volunteers to take her sister's place. And there's something about that that's moving for us. The cartoon Frozen has become wildly popular. So popular that we don't ever want to see it again. (laughs) And the movie ends, hopefully you know by this point, with this act of sacrificial love where Anna gives herself in exchange for Elsa's life. An act of true love. And there's something moving about that. In the hit TV show, This Is Us, there is a moment where the hero father, Jack, gives his life for the family dog, which is a little, you know, difficult for me, but his daughter asked him to. And so that's what happened. And something about that taps into something in us where we would say there are parts of that that just don't seem true when we go to Anselm's theory of satisfaction, this angry, wrathful, vengeful God that needs to be appeased. You know, there was a a Canaanite God called Molech in the Old Testament. And Molech needed child sacrifice to be appeased. The witness even of the Old Testament is that Yahweh is not Molech and even more so in the New Testament. And yet there is this sense when we read the Gospel that Jesus is doing something for us that we can't do for ourselves. And if we are only trust in it, it will have a transformational impact on reality and on us. Substitutionary atonement. And actually, this idea of substitution, or a better word might be representation, is embedded not only in the New Testament, but really throughout the Scriptures from the very first pages. If you were here on Wednesday night, we talked a little bit about the creation story and what it meant for human beings to be created in the image of God. And of course, at this church, we've talked before about how God is relational, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So part of the image of God is the fact that we are also relational social beings. We get that. You've heard me talk about that maybe too many times. But there's more to the image of God. Something about the sacredness of the person. You know, when you look at the creation story, after each and every single day of creation, God said, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. And we get to the sixth day with the creation of human beings, and God says, very good. There's something about the image of God that makes human life, all human life, sacred. And so we see that in the image of God. There is a job or jobs that human beings have been endowed with. Stewardship of creation. Taking care of God's creation. That has something to do with the image of God. And then there is also this reflection. Human beings reflect the glory of God. That's embedded in the story. So that human beings are supposed to be See, if this sounds familiar, salt and light in the world. Bringing seasoning and illumination to all of creation. The seasoning of God's character and the illumination of God's presence. It's embedded in what it means to be human. The human beings were supposed to represent and reflect the glory of God. And we know how that story went. Later, God is choosing to try to bring creation along in the way that God envisions it and creates a people through Abraham called Israel. And if you look at Israel's story, what you'll see is that these people were supposed to be not only a representative for all of humanity, used to transform all of humanity into who God created it to be, but to be the light of the world. Again, does that sound familiar? And yet, they fell short of that the glory of God. That may sound familiar too. And so something needed to be done that we could not do for ourselves. Who would do that thing? Who would do that thing out of, out of God's great love? Well, The gospel story tells us it was God and God's very self that did that thing. And so when we look, 
when we look in the Bible, what we see in Romans and in Isaiah and all through is this sense of God doing something for us that even in our belief we cannot do for ourselves. Look again at Romans chapter 3, if you've got it open. I wish we had time to go through every single syllable because there's more here than meets the eye. When you hear righteousness, I want you to also hear justice, and that will help with your understanding of wrath later, or covenant faithfulness. And when you see the word faith, I want you to understand that it can often be translated not faith in Jesus, but faithfulness of Jesus. And that matters when you read Isaiah 53. But now, apart from the law, the covenant faithfulness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the scriptures, the covenant faithfulness of God through faith in Jesus Christ or the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And there's the distinction. The gospel comes to us not by our faith in Jesus The action that happens in us and in the world happens not by our faith in Jesus, but happens by the faithfulness of Jesus apart from anything we can do otherwise. That's grace and that's mercy. And we see what that looks like even before this in the gospel before the gospel, which is Isaiah 53. So here's what I want you to do, and it may not all make sense, and it may may bother you a little bit, some of the phrases and, and turns of phrases, But I think you'll be able to feel the truth of it and the power of it. Turn over to Isaiah 53. When we talk about substitutionary atonement, this is what we're talking about. I'm going to read the first few lines, and then when we get to verse 5, I want you to join in with me on 5 and 6. And I don't just want you to read it, I want you to feel it. And I want you to understand that when you're reading Isaiah 53, you're not just reading about Jesus, you're reading about Israel. That whole story I mentioned to you before, right? Isaiah 40 through 55 is talking to us about this mysterious figure called the suffering servant that was meant to accomplish a kind of atonement and bring about light to the world. Okay? And that figure in pre-New Testament times, was not Jesus, but Israel. Israel reflecting the purpose of Adam and Eve. Israel and Adam and Eve falling short of that purpose. That purpose that now needed to be accomplished through someone else. Most of these promises and prophecies have at least a double meaning. So hear these words and then read these words with me. Who has believed what we have heard. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account." Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. Now join with me here. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Why? So that we might become the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Why? So that the gospel might be accomplished in us. Why? So that the world might be restored to its original purpose. Why? So that we might be restored fully in our relationship with God. In fact, if you look again at Romans 3, that is exactly what he's talking about. I won't read any more phrases except for this one. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. By the way, when you hear glory of God in the New Testament, you should be thinking about the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. 
and the emanating glory of God out of it as they followed it throughout the wilderness. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Most people can't enter that holy space with the ark without dying. Or later when the ark was in the temple, most people can't enter the holy of holies on a normal day. Even the priests, because the presence of God will kill them. Why? Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And yet, they are now justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a sacrifice or place of atonement. The Greek word there for place of atonement is hilasterion, which means, and we sang it earlier, mercy seat. The mercy seat is the lid on the Ark of the Covenant. And what would happen on the Day of Atonement is that priests would come in and they would sprinkle the blood of bulls and goats on the lid of the Ark of the Atonement, of the Ark of the Covenant, and that place would become a place where those who had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God were now able to enter into the Holy of Holies and commune with God in that place fully and finally. And yet those moments would pass, except that now through the work of Jesus on the cross and really throughout His entire incarnation, an abiding and eternal mercy seat has been created by the blood of Christ where we now, through faith and trusting in it, have been invited to enter God's space at any moment in time, in every place in the world, and commune eternally with God, experiencing then the life of the ages eternal life. Not just here and now, or not just there and then, but here and now. In fact, that's something that we really need to get. Because if we don't understand the goal of atonement, we won't understand how it works. And most of us have been taught that the goal of atonement, many of us have been taught that the goal of atonement is to get us into heaven. And what I want to tell you as we examine the New Testament is that is clearly not the goal of atonement. The gospel is not less than that. That is a part of the gospel. So I don't want to get you worried. Don't leave the church. But the gospel is a whole lot more than that. In fact, it would be more accurate to say that the ultimate goal of the gospel is not to get us into heaven, but to get heaven into us. And if we trust in Jesus and the power of His work on the cross, that begins to happen in a way that brings us into union with God. We'll talk more about that next week. So the invitation for you, by the blood of Christ and through the power of the cross, is whoever you are, whatever you've done or left undone, To trust in what Christ has done for you. Open your arms, your being, your heart. Receive God's grace and receive God's presence so that you can be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And so that each and every day that you live, you can experience more and more and more of union with God through Christ. By the way, That's just one angle on the atonement. We'll get to more in the weeks ahead. Would you pray with me? Holy God, you have done everything so that we can know you and experience your love. There is nothing more we can add to what you have done, even though we don't completely understand what you have done. Even my explanations, especially my my explanations of this, will fall short. We don't have to understand it for it to work. And that's so important. But we know what you've told us. The Messiah died for our sins according to the Scriptures so that we might experience union with God. God, help us to hear and heed that invitation, even now as we continue to worship. Amen.